I will present a procedure for the performance space design for this session. And in the afternoon session, we will, uh, I, me and my colleagues will present the special considerations for the primary structural components uh, in the micro low persisting system. First, I will explain a brief uh, introduction about the performance based design. Performance based uh, design is a more explicit evaluation of the safety and reliability of the structures. And it provides a clear levels of uh, clear assessment for the different levels of hazards to be designed and also check the corresponding performance to be uh, achieved. It is more uh, result uh, oriented rather than uh, following the prescribed procedures like in uh, code based design. And code based provisions are intended as especially uh, to provide a minimum level of safety and the shortcomings of the traditional code based design approaches uh, are implicitly uh, considered in the performance based uh, approaches. And also, code provisions uh, are generally uh, applicable for the low rise building, not for tall buildings. And in code provisions, uh, the intended performance are not checked uh, explicitly. Then I will go to a uh, brief explanation about the building structural system. In the building system, uh, we have the gravity load system, which composed of uh, beams, slabs, girders, columns, and uh, bearing walls. If we have to design the lateral loads, we have to provide the lateral load resisting system, such as moment resisting frames, columns, uh, shear walls, bracing, etc., to resist the primary lateral uh, to resist the lateral loads. To transfer those lateral loads, we have to provide uh, we have to design the diaphragms, especially for the seismic loads. The mass of the floor. Uh, if the mass of the floor is accelerate, you, it will have the inertial forces. Those inertial forces has to be transferred through uh, the, the slabs, uh, which we are uh, designed as a diaphragm action, in plate action. This is the uh, sample structural system. Because in the, uh, in the SE 4130, 
there are uh, details, uh, settings, criteria for each uh, threshold component. So to start the performance-based design, what information are uh, what information is required? First, we have to uh, get the uh, for BBT consultant, we have to get the uh, basics of design, which is uh, used by uh, structural designer. Then we will uh, modify the, that basis of design, uh, uh, including to include the BBT acceptance criteria, modeling, uh, and analysis procedures. Second one is the geotechnical investigation report. The third one is the seismic hazard uh, assessment, uh, site specific seismic hazard assessment report. And the last one is the uh, wind tunnel test report if wind tunnel test is conducted. So, in basis of design, we have to mention about the description of the building structural system. Code standards and references that we use, and loading criteria, uh, which is uh, which includes the gravity loads, uh, natural loads, uh, which includes wind and uh, seismic effects, uh, which, which includes the wind and seismic loading, and also mention clearly mention about the materials like uh, concrete, rebar, which strengths are we going to use. For tall buildings or concrete material properties, we have different. Uh, strengths used in different zoning and different uh, types of number. For example, in shear walls and columns, uh, in the lower levels we use higher strength and then uh, reduce gradually to the upper levels. Then uh, we have to uh, mention clearly how we will model the uh, building in, uh, for the linear analysis as well as uh, nonlinear analysis. And also mention the analysis procedures for different uh, levels of earthquakes, and then we have to mention the design procedures for each structural component. Lastly, we have to mention the acceptance criteria for the uh, global response of the building as well as the local response of the each uh, structural component. And if we use the capacity-based design approach for set, uh, certain structural members or structural system, we have to mention it uh, clearly. For example, if we use the outrigger system, in that system we will use the, if we use the capacity-based uh, design approach, we have to mention it clearly in the design criteria. Then, uh, for the geotechnical investigation report, uh, it should include the SPD value, soil stratification, and uh, properties of the soil, and soil type for the uh, seismic loading based on the shear wave velocity, and groundwater level, and if we use the uh, mat foundation or isolated footings, it should mention about the allowable bearing capacity of the soil. Not only the allowable bearing capacity, we, it, should, it should clearly mention uh, the factors to be used to increase the capacity for the transient loads like uh, wind and earthquakes, and as well as uh, the stress peaks. Uh, Generally, uh, we increase uh, about uh, four third for the transient load from the allowable uh, given allowable bearing capacity. In addition to that, that when we check the bed foundation in uh, safe and safe for the bearing uh, pressures, there are some stress peaks uh, at the some uh, vertical members. So if, you, if we check the uh, stress peaks, we further increase the capacity of the soil 
another one third, another uh, another uh, one point three times. So we will increase uh, uh, two times. First for trans uh, first for transient load, and first for another one is for stress mean. So these things should be clearly mentioned in the geotechnical report. For the modeling purpose, uh, we need the separate modulus of soil uh, for both particle and lateral uh, separate modulus. If there is any liquefaction potential, it should be mentioned clearly which uh, depth of the soil has the liquefaction potential. If we use the pile foundation, the soil rapport should have the ultimate end bearing pressure versus pile length, the curves. Uh, for the uh, ultimate skin friction pressure versus the pile length. So from that curve, from those curves, uh, we can calculate the uh, point spring at the end of the pile as well as the uh, line spring for the skin friction uh, effects. And also we will, uh, and also we have, and also we will have the uh, lateral spring for the lateral stiffness of the soil. The lateral spring from the soil to consider the lateral stiffness. So these informations are uh, important uh, for the modeling. Another thing is uh, for pile formation, we have uh, we should have the uh, pile allowable uh, bearing capacity as well as the pile, uh, as well as allowable pull off capacity for the if there is any tension in the pile. If we have the basement, the soil report should mention the basement wall pressure to be considered uh, for the uh, seismic earth pressure. And in the in seismic, site specific probabilistic seismic hazard assessment report, it, there will be uh, three recommended uh, uh, response factor for service level earthquake, design basis level earthquake, and maximum considered earthquakes. And uh, and uh, consultant should uh, consultant will give us the ground motions for the MCE level response spectrum. The ground motions are scaled. Uh, to match with the response spectrum, uh, either uh, linear scaling or uh, spectral matching, as I mentioned yesterday. If there is a pile foundation, uh, there are two ways to model the uh, foundation system in the nonlinear model. One is we add all the piles in the nonlinear model. In that case, we have to apply the ground motions along the uh, depth of the piles. Another simplified way is just uh, provide the pin or fixed supports at the end of the vertical members at the pile cap level and apply only the, apply the ground motions only in that level. We normally use uh, the second option uh, which we simplify the model and apply the ground motion at the pile cap level. This figure is for uh, if for the modeling of parts in a linear model. In that case, we have to model. We have to apply the ground motions uh, along the length of the path, and also we have to model the dashboard to model the uh, damping effect of the soil. That one is quite uh, complicated. This is the uh, symbol uh, of the response spectrum curves for different levels of earthquake. Service level earthquake has 50% of probability, probability of accidents in 30 years, which has 43 year return period. For design basis earthquake uh, DBE level, which has 10% of probability of accidents in 50 years, which has post 75 year return period. And maximum considered earthquake which has 2% of probability of accidents in 50 years with 2,475 year return period. In the uh, PSHU report, 
they will give the it will give it it will mention the recommended design spectrum. We should we have to use that one, especially for the code based design, not directly using the use the DBE level spectra. That recommended spectra is uh, two thirds of MCE response spectra. Which uh, may or may not be exactly uh, for 175 year, but that we read. In Thailand, the uh, DBE level uh, response factor in the code is, which has, uh, which is two third of MCE, but it is not 475 year return period, which has 1,000 year return period. The last one is the wind tunnel test for code. In wind tunnel test, there are uh, three, ty three types of test. One is for uh, structure load studies, and second one is for cladding pressure measurement, and the third one, and the third one is for the pedestrian comfort study. But for the uh, structural engineers, we focus on the structure load study, structure loads and building motion and study. From wind and the test report, we will get 10 year return period point uh, and 50 year return period window for the ultimate strength design. Sometimes wind and the consultant gave us 700 year return period wind instead of 50 year return period window. So if we get the 50 year return period window, we have to use load factor in the ultimate strength design which is which has uh, 1.6 in the load combination. For the 10 year return period window we do not use in the uh, ultimate strength design. We use for the serviceability requirement checks for drifts and displacements. And also, wind tunnel test uh, report mentioned the comparison of the wind tunnel test results with uh, various uh, wind codes. So, from that uh, comparison, you can see the uh, wind tunnel results are higher than the code based wind or lower than the code based wind. And also, we have to check the floor accelerations uh, of the building for one year and five year return period in load for, uh, from the wind tunnel test as well as the rotational velocity. If the flow accelerations are beyond the limits, we have to revise our uh, structural system. And wind tunnel test report also uh, shows the natural uh, frequency sensitivity study for the uh, wind tunnel test results. Normally, it increased uh, twenty percent and reduce twenty percent of the structural stiffness of the building and give the results. This is the uh, procedure for the performance based uh, design. First. We should contact the geotechnical investigation and probabilistic seismic hazard assessment at the beginning of the uh, project. Because probabilistic seismic hazard assessment it takes time uh, about two to three months. Then uh, we start the preliminary design uh, for the structural system development from the uh, architectural uh, drawings. Then, uh, we done a, then uh, after we uh, have done the preliminary design, if we know the uh, model analysis results, model properties of the building, we have to convey that information to wind tunnel test consultant and start the wind tunnel test. After getting the wind tunnel test results, we have to do the detailed code based design to calculate the uh, reinforcements and detailing. Then, after finalizing the detailed uh, code based design, we will start the performance based evaluation for service level earthquake and MCE level earthquake. Then, 
we will submit the results for peer review. So in preliminary design, we have to uh, but we have to we have to develop the structural system, which uh, we will consider as a lateral load resisting system or gravity load resisting uh, system. We have to select the, the either uh, which basement wall system or dual system with a special moment resisting frame or intermediate moment resisting frame. We have to select first. Then we have to uh, create the linear analysis models. We normally use ETAPs uh, for the linear analysis. <coughs> then, uh, in first, and then we create the final. Uh, we create ETAPs models and provide the uh, stiffness modifiers for different uh, types of analysis. For wind uh, analysis, we use different types of stiffness modifier. For seismic analysis, we use uh, different types of uh, stiffness modifiers. Then uh, we check the overall response from that uh, model. For the model analysis, gravity load response, lateral load response. Uh, in lateral load response, we check only for DBE and uh, wind. In model analysis, we have to check the mode shapes, natural period of the building, modal participating uh, mass ratio of the building. If the, if the natural period is uh, quite long, we have to uh, adjust the special system or uh, member sizes. If the mode shapes are not uh, translation in the first mode, we should uh, adjust the uh, stiffness of the structural system. Then we have to we have to also check the gravity load response, especially for the deflections and building weight per floor area. Normally, for the high seismic zone with the special moment resisting frames and shear walls. The building weight per floor area, which is uh, dead load plus 25% uh, of a uh, light load, it is about uh, 15 kilonewton per square meter for the reinforced concrete building. If we check the building weight per floor area is uh, let's say 20 or 25 kilonewton per square meter, uh, we our we should uh, review our structural system. The slab thickness may be too large, or uh, the shear walls or beams may be too large. And or another reason might be our material properties, and the weight of the material may not be correct. For lateral load response, we have to check the base shear, slowly drift, and uh, lateral displacement. If the drift and displacements are not within the limits, we have to revise our work, the structural system and recheck. Then we have to uh, check, uh, for we have to do the preliminary, preliminary member sizing. We have to check the structural density ratios of our lateral load resisting system. For example, uh, for if we use the bearing wall system, structural density ratio may be uh, approximately 8% of the uh, typical floor area. Structural density ratio is the uh, summation of the cross-sectional area of the core and shear walls divided by the uh, total, uh, uh, divided by the typical floor area. So if the, for the gravity load uh, design building, uh, if we do not consider the lateral load, that structural density ratio will be small which may be around uh, 2%. And we have to determine the slab thickness of the uh, uh, slab thickness, shear wall thickness, coupling beam sizes, all uh, sizes. For shear wall thickness, we have to take care, uh, we have to check the shear stresses for the maximum capacity limit. We have, uh, if the 
that capacity, maximum capacity limit uh, is based on the thickness of the shear wall, not based on the shear reinforcement. If that capacity this limit doesn't uh, satisfy, we have to increase the thickness of the wall. After a preliminary design, and after getting the wind, after preliminary design, we have to convey the uh, model information to the wind tunnel uh, consultant. We have to give the natural view data of the building, uh, model displacements of the uh, building, so they can conduct the wind tunnel test. So after preliminary design, we continue the detailed design, and if we get the wind tunnel test results, we have to consider the uh, wind tunnel test and the loading from the wind tunnel test. Pre in preliminary design, we have to use the, the co-based wind loading. For the uh, detailed co-based design, we, in the modeling stage, we will use the nominal material properties and crack, uh, crack sections for the different uh, types of loading and if we model the and soil springs has to be modeled for the foundation system and the basement walls. And then we will conduct the uh, gravity load uh, design for slabs and secondary beams and uh, wind design from the wind and the test results. And for the submissibility check for the tall buildings, we uh, check the story drift of 0.4% uh, and therefore displacement of uh, H over 400 for 10 year return to rear wind load. And for the floor acceleration, 1 year and 5, and, uh, five year return to rear wind load, which is mentioned. Floor acceleration, we do not need to calculate, uh, we do not need to determine from our model. We then have the results already mentioned. But story drift and uh, therefore displacement, we have to apply the wind tunnel loading in our model and analyze and check the different displacement. For the seismic design, uh, we have to use the recommended design spectra for, for DBE level, which is two third of MCE from PSHA results. We have to apply the uh, seismic loads in principal direction of the building, not always x and y direction. Principal direction of the building can be determined from the model analysis, uh, model base here of the building. Uh, we will explain uh, the, how to determine the principal direction in hands-on uh, session. We got the base here for, from the mode one uh, of the building and find the resultant uh, post angle. That angle will be the principal direction of the uh, building. Then we have to scale the base shear uh, from the response spectrum analysis to the equivalent static analysis. In the in base shear scaling, we have to take care. Uh, we have we should scale the we have to scale the base shear above the uh, ground level. We have we should not scale with the base shear below the ground levels. It will underestimate the design base shear. If we have the very large podium and the, if there is a vertical irregularity in the system, we have to check. The, we we should check. We should plot the story shear along the height of the building for the scaling. Not only checking only checking the base shear at the ground level. Because sometimes based, response spectrum base shear is suddenly increased in the lower level, but in equivalent static base shear it is not increased that much. So in that case, when we scale to the equivalent static at that very high uh, story shear from the response spectrum analysis, the scale factor may be quite small. So we should see the story shear along the height of the building and find the appropriate scale factor. We have to check the uh, accidental torsion of the building and if needed, we have to amplify the uh, torsional effects. If there is no 
uh, amplification, at least we have to consider the 5% eccentricity for the torsional effects. Then we have to consider the directional and orthogonal effects in the design of combination. Normally we consider 100% in one direction and 30% in other direction. For the D-level analysis, we use the EDAP model, linear analysis model, use the 5% of critical damping for the model uh, energy dissipation. And we have to define the load combinations with the load factors and then design the detail, the design and detail the reinforcement. This is the uh, the response of the building and uh, how we design, what is the design base here of the building. We do not uh, design the building, we do not design the building to remain elastic in seismic loading. If the building uh, responds elastic, this will be the elastic base here. If we design for to remain elastic, it will be very costly. So, we provide the capability and reduce the design phase here by this response, for, uh, response modification coefficient R divide, by, uh, divide that uh, elastic base here by R and this is the design phase here that we use in the pro phase design. But for the uh, important uh, members like the tire frames or the transfer girders, we should not uh, design using this base here. We have to increase the base here back because this is the structural response and uh, the structural inelastic response and the seismic loading. So for the important systems, they should resist the maximum force under the earthquake. So the, we have to amplify back to uh, estimate the maximum uh, probable force in the system. That over strength factor, uh, omega naught, which is uh, about 2.823. So for that omega naught is applied in the load combinations for the design of uh, diaphragms, because diaphragms should not be yielded under the Earthquake, and also if we have the transfer gutter, the those gutters should not, the, those gutters should have uh, resist, uh, should have to resist the uh, seismic forces, should have to resist the maximum seismic forces occurred in the uh, system. Not only those gutters, if we have uh, not, uh, we have to design the columns supporting those gutters uh, using these uh, using the omega naught factor, but. In, if we do the performance-based evaluation for MCE level, we do not need to consider those R factor and omega naught factor because in our uh, MCE level evaluation, our analysis already captured those maximum response. So we do not need to amplify uh, the forces by those factors. Those factors are also very arbitrary because we are not sure that omega naught uh, the force will always be uh, larger 2.8 times than the design ratio. We are not sure. So, for uh, so our nonlinear model for for MC level, it gives us the more realistic results. After detailed uh, design, we will continue the SLE, the service level evaluation. In service level evaluation also, we use the linear analysis model. We use the EDAPS model for the service level evaluation. But in that EDAPS model, we have to uh, change the stiffness modifier for the SLE earthquake. And the seismic loading, we have to use the seismic loading without reduction by the scale factor. Not like uh, DVD level earthquake. DVD level earthquake, we reduce the scale, uh, we reduce the seismic, elastic seismic force by uh, R factor or uh, 
scale to the equivalent static phase here. Right? In service level earthquake, we want to have the building to remain elastic and operational after the earthquake. So there will be no significant damage. So we should not reduce the reduce the response by the R factors. And we have to use the uh, critical damp 22.5 percent of critical damping, and also use the you know combinations without load factors. So the building will remain elastic if we design uh, for that. And we have to still consider the seismic orthogonal effects: 100 percent in one direction and 30 percent in another direction. But in SLE evaluation, we do not need to consider the uh, accidental eccentricities like in TV level design. In service level evaluation, we do not use one response modification, coefficient R and overstrength uh, factor, omega redundancy factor, deflection amplification factors. We do not use those factors. In acceptance, in acceptance criteria for SLE earthquake, the mental diversity ratios for the deformation control action we allow until uh, one point, DC ratio of 1.5. But for the force control action, we allow until only 0 0.7. I will explain you in details about the deformation control actions and uh, force control actions in later slides. And capacity of the members has to, uh, has to be calculated using nominal material properties with the strength reduction factor of 1.0. In code based design for DBE level, we use three factors. For the shear, we use 0.75. For bending, we use 0.9. But here, we do not need to use. And story drift should not exceed 0.5% to protect the damage in the natural components. In MCE level evaluation, we use the nonlinear model. Normally, we model it in uh, perform 3D uh, software, and we contact the nonlinear response uh, <coughs> analysis for uh, seven ground motion. If we scale the uniform hazard uh, response spectrum, if we use the conditional mean spectra that uh, was explained by Dr. Terafan yesterday, we have to use at least nine ground motion for the conditional mean spectra. Uh, it uh, developed for the at least uh, three natural periods of the building. So, for so you will have the three response spectrum curve. Three ground motions will be scaled to each response spectrum curve. So, we will have the uh, nine ground motions. But most of the project we use uh, seven pairs of ground motions uh, for which are scaled to the uniform uh, hazard spectrum. Each ground motion set has the X and Y component or uh, side uh, fault, par fault parallel or fault number component. If the building is uh, far from the fault, we have to, uh, we can apply the ground motions in the principal direction of the building. Let's, uh, but if the building is Near to the fault, we should apply the ground motions according to the uh, uh, fault line, fault parallel, and fault normal. In nonlinear model, we consider 2.5 percent constant modal damping for all modes for the and model uh, energy dissipation with a small fraction of relay damping. The damping will be. Uh, Increased uh, during the analysis uh, when the members are uh, yielded. But we cannot model uh, everything in detail, so we consider 2.5% for the end model uh, damping. We use the average demand from the seven ground motions uh, approach, and uh, capacities of the threshold members are calculated using the expected strengths. 
excited material properties and the strand reduction factor uh, of one point as you know. This table is from LAP PSCC 2014. For the expected material properties, for the concrete, uh, we use 1.3 times F prime C uh, nominal strength. For the reinforcing steel, we use 1.17 times of the nominal yield strength of the steel. <coughs> it also mentioned for the structural steel members in the table. When we do the nonlinear modeling, uh, do we have to calculate the capacity of the members to model, uh, for example, uh, we have to calculate the moment capacity of the beams and also the coupling beams to define the nonlinear changes. In that case, we have to uh, organize our design information properly in, uh, probably to de uh, to define the inch names to be assigned in the model because in one project you may have a thousand of beams so if we do not provide a proper naming system for the uh, girder changes it will be messed up in the model so we have to take care uh, to organize the design information. Not only for the uh, beams, also for the shear walls, we have to calculate the uh, shear wall fiber sections from the provided reinforcement. So the naming is very important because we have to define uh, thousand of uh, hinge properties in the nonlinear model. Let's continue the, the deformation control actions. For the uh, response of the member, which the behavior is tactile and reliable in elastic deformation without any uh, substantial strength loss, we can define as that, that component as a deformation control action. So like the flexure response of the beam. So we can allow we can define as a deformation control action because after leaving it will not have suddenly uh, strength loss. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, in that uh, deformation control action, we have to calculate the uh, Yielding capacity, for example, for a beam hinge, moment hinge. We have to calculate the yielding moment capacity of the member using expected strength properties and get this point. And then this one, we can find uh, which is about uh, 1.13 times of the yielding uh, capacity. Then this uh, rotation, elastic rotation, we can get from the ESC 41 uh, criteria, right? And then it will be strength loss. And this residual strength also, we have to consider this uh, B distance. That one has to be also considered carefully when we define the uh, deformation control actions. Because in ASC 41, some uh, collapse prevention acceptable limits are in this zone. So if we do not model properly, that, uh, we cannot check uh, the performance of the member uh, in details. For the force control action, like the shear response, so we uh, normally model as a linear response, which is uh, axial compression load in the columns, uh, shear wall shear, beam shear, diaphragm shear, so those responses we consider as uh, force control action. In LATB BSDC 2014, uh, there are two types of force control actions. One is critical action, actions in which uh, failure mode uh, poses severe consequences to structural stability and uh, 
gravity and uh, natural load. In, if those critical actions occur, we have to uh, multiply the response from the nonlinear analysis by 1.5 factor to the mean value of the uh, seven ground motion results. Uh, for the non critical action switch, if that uh, failure does not result the structural instability or potentially life threatening damage, we do not need to multiply with factor of 1.5. These are the classification of actions for the structural components for the nonlinear uh, uh, model. For the shear wall structure, we consider the uh, we consider as the deformation control action, but for the shear wall shear, we consider it as force control action. And if the shear wall shear failure is very critical, so we consider it as critical. So when we check the shear wall shear design, we have to multiply with 1.5 load factor. For the topic beams uh, fracture, we consider as deformation control. Most of the shear uh, response we consider as the force control action. But for the diagonal ring force coupling, for the shear deformation, we consider as uh, deformation control action. For the deformation control action, we just uh, need to check the deformation uh, demand and the, uh, based on the acceptance criteria from the ESC 41. This is the acceptance criteria for MCE level earthquake. In MCE level earthquake, we check two types of drifts. One is quick transient drift, and the second one is residual drift. In peak transient drift, we limit the mean value from the seven ground motion. It should be less than 3%. But any drift from each ground motion should not exceed 0.5%. For residual drift, uh, it should, the mean value should be less than 1%, but maximum drift should not exceed 1.5%. Residual drift is not checked in code based design. That a residual drift is to prevent if and uh, after the earthquake, the building may not go back to its original position. It may be tilted. So if it is tilted uh, very large with a very large drift, it will it is difficult for demolition of the building. So to prevent to prevent those, we check the residual drift. To check the residual drift, when we run the nonlinear time history analysis, we, for example, the ground motion is uh, 25 seconds duration. During the analysis, we should not stop the, that ground, stop the analysis at 25 seconds exactly, because the ground shaking stop, but the building may still oscillate. So we should analyze at least uh, one natural period or maybe 10 or 15 seconds more uh, although the ground motion stop. So the building, uh, we can capture the oscillation of the building uh, in, the, uh, in more realistic manner. If we stop suddenly, the building may sway very large and the analysis stop, the residual drift may be very large. Actually, the building may come back. For the coupling beam uh, in elastic rotations, uh, we check for 0 0.05 radian for the uh, diagonal reinforced coupling beam. For the columns, uh, if we model as a uh, nonlinear with the fibers, we have to check the fracture rotation. But for the shear response, we have to consider that as a critical action and multiply with 1.5 times in value. That 1.5 times for the critical actions uh, is to consider the variability uh, of the results from the seven ground motions. Because if we check only the mean, it may not capture the maximum value. So we 
uh, checked up, we use that factor. For the shear wall uh, fracture response, we check the reinforcement axial strain as well as the concrete compressive strain. For the reinforcement axial strain, for we use 0 0.05 for tension and 0 0.02 for compression. But for concrete, there we have to check for uh, different types of uh, different uh, acceptance criteria for fully confined concrete and intermediately confined concrete. For fully confined concrete, we use we normally use 0 0.015, but it is quite big. It normally it hardly exceeds 0 0.004. For intermediately confined concrete, we use 0 0.004 as a limit. If we have the fully confined concrete, we do not need to multiply the strength with 1.5, but if we use intermediately confined concrete, we multiply the strength with uh, excel strength with 1.5. Here was here we check with the 1.5 times mean value and other response like the mat foundation, pile foundation, uh, diaphragms we consider as a force control action and design to remain elastic. This is uh, this picture is about how much important for the residual trade. For example, under the after the earthquake, if this building is tilted, let's say more than one percent. So after the earthquake, uh, the authority may say, okay, this building is in danger. Let's say it is attack this building. But other small buildings, they are uh, less than the grid is less than one percent. So they are not red tag. But because of this building, other buildings also may be red tag. Because if this building uh, falls down, it will affect the other buildings as well. So uh, we have to take care of the residual drift as well for the tall buildings. Because this small building is red tag for 1%, it is not affecting other surrounding buildings. But for the tall buildings, it is quite important. These are the <coughs> stiffness assumptions you use in the final element models for different level of earthquakes and wind. For Philippines projects, we use uh, service level earthquake and wind stiffness modifiers, uh, same value. But for DB and MCE, we use different values. After the analysis, uh, we have to evaluate the results. So in nonlinear analysis, the results extraction or processing and converting into the presentable form, it takes a lot of time. Even the analysis for one ground motion, we have to analyze maybe uh, three, two or three days for one ground motion. So we do not analyze all of the ground motions in one model. We have to uh, run the ground motions simultaneously. So we have to run seven models simultaneously. <coughs> then we have to extract the results and check the response. When we check the <coughs> Uh, response, we should not uh, get the uh, forces or deformations and get the reinforcement, get to calculate the required reinforcement. We should not do it directly. We have to try to understand the response of the building from uh, check the results, for example, check the deformed shape of the building during the time history, and also check the any moment diagrams shear diagrams of the members for each time step. In perform 3D, we can plot step by step uh, many moment and shear diagram. So we should check those things carefully to understand the response, rather than calculating the reinforcement uh, directly. For example, uh, we try to uh, design the columns to remain elastic in PMM under MCE level that in the moment frame. 
So if we check the if we get the uh, any more uh, axial load and moment M2 and M3 from the time history analysis results, the values are very high, and we just design and get the reinforcement. It try to satisfy that uh, demand and get the reinforcement. The reinforcement will be very high, and we should check why the demand is high. I found that in one project, we checked the step-by-step column uh, many moment diagram. We found that in some steps, uh, due to the yielding, highly yielding of the connecting beam, the beam uh, rotation is going to the uh, strand loss portion. So the column doesn't have the lateral restraint and it doesn't have the level curvature uh, between the flows. The, the unsupported length of the column is very large and it becomes, the moments become very large. So in that case, rather than we increase the column reinforcement, we should increase the beam reinforcement. So the beam will not yield highly. If the beam is not going to strand loss, the column will have the double calibration moment in each story and moment can be minimized. So those things are important to uh, understand the response of the building. Normally, we check the uh, after the linear analysis, we check the overall response. Base shear, ratio between inelastic base shear and elastic base shear, uh, story drift, transient drift, and residual drift, and lateral displacement, flow acceleration, energy dissipation of each component, and also energy error. We can check the energy error from the model, and if the energy error is more than 5%, we should uh, we check the model and reanalyze the model. This is the sample result uh, from the nonlinear time history analysis. We check this is the base year in terms of weight of the building. This is uh, the green one is the inelastic base year, and the yellow one is the Elastic base shear at the MCE level, which is about normally we got about 1.5 to 2 times uh, reduced from the elastic base shear. If the base shear values are not reasonable, we have to recheck our model and uh, rerun the analysis. For example, uh, if the base year is not reduced, it is the same as the elastic base year. So we, it means that we can we can reduce the reinforcement in the system. So it will have yielding and uh, and reduce the base year. And this is the sum of plot of the transient drift. The black one is the average of seven ground motion. They are well. Uh, this is a residual drift. And this is the lateral displacement under MCE level. That lateral displacement, uh, we, we do not have any limit, but just check uh, how much is the lateral displacement. For the tall building, it can be more than one meter. And also, we have to check the absolute uh, flow acceleration of the building uh, for the uh, diaphragm design, because uh, we need to, uh, to use that flow acceleration values for the tower diaphragm design. Another one is the energy dissipation plots. Energy dissipation uh, plots are very useful for the qualitative assessment of the uh, response of the building. It can, we cannot assess uh, quantitatively, but we can assess uh, how much uh, which components are highly yielded, which components are not yielded. For example, uh, in, this, in those plots, the, this is from the, uh, for the shear walls. 
So in this building, shear wall is not yielding significantly. Most of the yielding is energy dissipation is coming from the diagonal with force stopping means and the uh, conventional with force stopping means. So from those plots, if we we can check the damage of the structure. If we happen to do the evaluation of the uh, moment frames, if we model, if we model it nonlinear uh, in both columns and in both columns and uh, beams, we can check. For example, this uh, is, 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 is the duration of the ground motion. This is the energy dissipation. For example, this. This, let's say this one is uh, 10 seconds. So if it is, uh, if the beam is, beams are yielding at 10 seconds and columns are yielding at, start yielding at 20 seconds, so uh, columns are stronger than beams. So strong column with beam criteria is uh, satisfying. But in case, if the columns are yielding first, so Columns are not, we can uh, say that columns are not stronger than the uh, beams. So strong column moving criteria is not satisfied. For the component response, we have to check the uh, strength capacity for the force control action as well as the uh, rotation uh, deformation capacity for each uh, component. Uh, we will explain in details how to check uh, those uh, structural components in the afternoon sessions. After uh, completion of the uh, performance-based design, we have uh, we have to submit our design drawings, uh, calculations, models, PSH uh, reports, uh, geotechnical reports to the uh, peer review. In my opinion, the peer reviewer should be uh, should involved at the early stage of the design. After, uh, after we uh, develop the design, uh, of design, we should submit to the peer reviewer, so if they have comment, they can comment to us. If we submit everything uh, after completion of the uh, design and submit the basis of design and peer review comment and to change the design criteria, uh, to change the modeling approach, it will be, it will take a lot of time uh, to do the design again. So we should do progressive uh, submission to the peer review. For example, if we, fi if we finish the perform 3D nonlinear model, we should submit to the we are here before the analysis. After analysis and getting the results, if we submit, and if something wrong, if something, uh, if we are a comment on the model, we have to redo the whole process again. So we have to submit progressively our uh, results to the our work to the peer reviewer, and peer reviewer will give us the comments uh, with the well organized. Uh, log file and we have to respond to each comment uh, by additional uh, calculation reports or explanations to the peer reviewer. After the conclusion, after resolving all the comments, uh, conclusion from, uh, at the conclusion of the review, peer reviewer will submit the references and scope of review which includes the comment log, indicates uh, their opinion, and regarding the design as general performance to the requirements and the guidelines of the document. Thank you.